We used to reckon there are more roach in England. I don't know if that's true now, but certainly they live in more places than any other fish. They're most adaptable. They live in ponds right up to great big lakes and from the quietest rivers right up to some of the fastest ones. Of course, in some places, they're tiny, like sardines. Where I was brought up, where I learned to fish for them, a good roach was three quarters of a pound and we were very glad to catch a pound one. And we didn't hear about anything bigger. There weren't any fishing newspapers in those days. But the rumours travelled slowly and we started to hear about roach of two pounds, even two and a half, particularly from a place called Horsey Mere, which was in West Yorkshire. In its distribution, the roach illustrates at the same time the adaptation that a fish makes. Back in the days when we used to stuff fish, if we caught a big one, I was once in a fish stuffer's shop and he had two big roach there. They were both just on two pounds. I'd never seen a roach as big before, but they were completely different. One was deep and silver, almost like a bream, and the other was torpedo-shaped and a sort of browny green. Although they were just the same weight, the first of those fish came from East Anglia, from slow water, and the second one came from Hampshire. In fact, it was the first time I'd ever heard of the Hampshire raven, so I had to go and try and fish it. When I got there, I found the big fish were in big shoals. Quite often, in most species of fish, the big ones leave the shoal and live in a solitary way, like bull elephants. But the avon roach were in shoals up to two pounds, and I had to try and catch one. Well, I sat in a boat with Howard Marshall and fished down the same swim, over the same ground bait, over and over again. He had five over two pounds. I had one pound thirteen, one pound fourteen, one pound fifteen. Never a fish at two pounds. I couldn't understand why it was at the time, but I'm sure it was, because his tackle was better set to trip right along close to the bottom than mine was. On the River Kennet, which is another big roach water, I soon after that got a chance to lie on my stomach and watch shoals of big roach and see how the shoal arranged itself and behaved. And what usually happened was that at the front of the shoal, the small fish, the smaller fish, they were all pretty big, the smaller fish lay higher up in the water and in the front of the shoal. And the biggest fish were always right low down on the bottom and lying back at the shoal, hanging back. The smaller ones rushed in to feed. The big ones were more cautious and deliberate. So obviously it was the bait that was set right and which just tripped its way along, touching the bottom, which caught the big fish. When you watch a shoal of roach like that, you get an idea of the nature of the fish. Richard Walker says that roach haven't got the brains of other fish, but they're protected by their extreme nervousness. And I'm sure that's the point. Roach are a perfect example of shoal emotions, crowd emotions, like football crowds, audience, when a feeling goes right the way through the whole crowd of people, the whole shoal of fish. And when they have a feeling, they all share it. So when an angler is working up a shoal, as they say, when he's fishing, what he's doing is quietly and carefully getting that shoal into a safe feeding mood. And then he's got to keep it in that mood. If he scares one of them, the fright feelings go right through the whole shoal of fish. This is when a man says they've gone off the feed. As a matter of fact, it's probably his fault. Now, with all those different waters holding roach, naturally there are different methods, tremendously different methods of fishing for roach. Old Skip Parker, who taught us to fish the Avon 40 years ago, used to trot down from a boat in a roaring eight-foot swim. It took a lot of lead and naturally, therefore, a big float. Luckily, in the fast water, the roach gave a big snatching bite and a big float would register it. Skip used to use one as big as a Corona cigar. It was made from the quill of a condor, which is the largest flying bird in the world, a sort of vulture from South America. And I can remember the Hampshire fishing shops selling those condor quills. A while ago, I tried to get some. I, I discovered that the zoo had one condor and that the zoo aquarium wanted some freshwater lampreys, so I took them up 700 freshwater lampreys from my watercress beds and they promised me a condor quills when he molted. <laughs>
But I, they found afterwards they'd done a deal with a man called Dolmetsch, who makes harpsichords, to sell him the condor quills to pluck the strings, so I had to make do with pelicans. Nowadays I use double swan quills. At about this time, when I first saw the Avon, up on the Thames, I saw the opposite kind of roach fishing. There, in the backwaters particularly, the water was very quiet, and the Thames roach men, the famous old Thames roach men, used to sit there pole fishing, fishing with a long pole without a reel, a whalebone tip on the end of it, and a tight line between it and the float, and they always used to have a little spoon net to land their fish with. When those roach took, they took gently, like thistle down. And these fishermen sat, always on a mahogany box, silent and completely concentrated. And you could stand behind them and try and see the bite. And you, most times you couldn't see what they were striking at. Sometimes the float would just check a little on its way downstream, sometimes just tilt a little to one side, and then with a little lift, they picked the fish up beautifully. They were silent, severe, extremely respectable chaps. One of them, I remember, was a lavatory attendant from the east end of London. He used to come out at the weekend for some fresh air. I remember in the Camden Town murder case, a man gave witness of having seen something at four o'clock in the morning in an east London street. The judge asked him what on earth he was doing about at that time of the morning. And he replied with dignity, My lord, I am a roach fisher. And they believed him. It was no accident that he was setting off at three o'clock on a Sunday morning because morning and evening are terribly important in roach fishing. It was Richard Walker again who first demonstrated how sensitive they are to light in their feeding habits. When the light is bright, they just won't feed. And he went out with a light meter and he measured it and he measured the light just at the point where they would come on the feed. And he showed that there was an exact amount of light that put them off. So you find that demonstrated time and again. As a matter of fact, the biggest fish I ever caught, it was the only two and a half pound roach I ever caught, illustrated that exactly. I was sitting in the evening, and I'd been fishing and catching fairish roach, and then I'd stopped catching them. And as it went on, I was doing the old fisherman's thing of saying, well, I'll have just one more trot down, one more swim down, and then another one, and then another one, and then it went quietly and gently down the float, and I had a two and a half roach just when the dark had descended to the point where he thought he'd feed. We used to use caddis worm a lot in those days, go and pick them up in the brooks. They were a great roach bait. I think most fishermen nowadays don't know what they are. We also used to catch almost all our roach on bread paste. The roach bait. Funnily enough, as I grew up, I found I couldn't catch them on, on it. And yet, if I go out with Owen Wentworth, He'll catch fish on bread paste, bread crust, bread flake, and I'll have to use maggots. The truth, of course, is, of course, that I'm a pipe smoker, and the bread, I think, picks up the taint from your fingers. So I ice fish with maggots because maggots the smoker's bait. He stinks so much that he overcomes the taint of the tobacco. There's no doubt at all that if the day screw Three times as big, he'd be the most sporting fish in Britain. The trouble is that most days are about the size of a good sardine. But there are a few rivers, the Ivel, the Kennet, the Avon, where the dace will grow sometimes to over a pound. And then he's quite a fish. The fact is he's very fast. There was a German who measured the speed that fish could travel at. The Germans like measuring details like that. And he discovered that the dace can do two meters in a second. At the other end of the scale, the carp and the tench can't quite do half a metre. And some of you who have felt a hooked carp make his first run will be staggered with the idea that the dace is four times faster. He's fast because he lives in fast water and he has to be able to grab a bait that uh, he's travelling quickly. But not only does he grab the bait quickly, he lets go of it just as fast the moment he suspects it. He's as quick as a snake. There is one advantage, he doesn't scare easily. He'll keep coming, and you'll probably keep missing him. Turing used to say that there's no sport like dotting dace, and if you can hit the majority of dace that ride to your bait, then you're a fisherman. There is one trick I learned to get him to hang on a bit longer and not feel the hook so quickly, and that is a big bait on a little hook, four or five maggots 
on a number 16, just nicked on. Of course, then you'll miss some the other way around because the hook is too much buried. But on the whole, I think there's profit in the trick. My favorite method of fishing for days is standing in a shallow, trotting down 30 or 40 yards with the bait just about a foot below the float because days feed well up in the water. In order to do this, you'll need a trotting rod with a pretty free action because you're going to have about 30 or 40 yards on the water when the float goes down and when you slash up that amount of line in order to connect with the dace you're going to break it unless you've got some action in the rod. When you do get him then imagine he's a three pounder and then you realize that he would show a trout something. When you're fishing like this you can scrubble about and kick up the bottom with your wellingtons as much as you like because it puts insects up into the current and that's his way of life taking the insects that run down in the current. I used to try and stand still but then I noticed that when the cattle came down to the cattle drink behind and stood in the water, the dace came on the feed. The cattle were kicking up the bottom, sending down silt and insects, and the dace were feeding. After that, when I was roach fishing, I used to watch the cattle, and when they came down to the drink, I used to put the roach rod down and go in the stand in the water and fish for dace. When Turing spoke of dotting dace, he meant fly fishing. And Dace is the finest of all first fly fish. The great thing about him for a beginner is that he'll keep coming. He doesn't scare. The shoal of Dace will go skidding and slipping around an area of water from one weed gap to another, and you can fish over the same shoal for hours. And they'll keep coming as long as you keep missing them. With a fly, he's even quicker than he is with a bait because an artificial fly just doesn't feel the same as a real one, and he lets go almost soon as he touches it. In the old days, they used to put a little bit of white wash leather on the hook for him to hang on to. It looked like a maggot, but of course you mustn't have a maggot for fly fishing. That was considered unsporting. But in fact, there's nothing like a maggot on the hook of your fly when you're fly fishing. The best of all is a black gnat with a little maggot on the hook. I used to know some completely uncatchable dace. Like most uncatchable fish, they were bridge fish. They were in a pool under a bridge where people went by and looked at them and tried to catch them. And everybody had tried everything. They were spooked by any kind of a float. And artificial flies, they just bumped them with their nose. And yet they weren't feeding on all the time on their own real food. I told an old countryman I know about them, and he made his preparations. He arrived one Sunday morning with a bottle of live blue bottles. It was a breezy day. He had a long roach rod. He hooked a blue bottle in the, his back, alive, on a tiny hook, and then he let the line float out in the breeze and just dapped it on the water. And there was the blue bottle buzzing on the surface of the water, and the dace took them, and they went on buzzing in their mouths. So they just hung on to them, because they must be real, and he caught the whole lot. It was a pity, really. What's the biggest dace you can catch? Well, in 50 years, I suppose I've had half a dozen that might have made the pound. You can mistake a big dace for a chub. All the books show you how not to. But actually, it's not very easy. Once you know them, they're quite unmistakable. I don't know what the biggest dace of all that I caught was, because my scales always stay in the basket. I don't like turning fishing into a numbers game. But he was very big. And the interesting thing is, I caught him on a ledger. In a slack at the side of the river. So even the dace, when they grow big, leave the shoal and become solitary and lazy and go for a good bait. I caught this particular fish on a lobworm. I was once teaching a little boy to fish on the River Kennet, and he said to me, if I catch a big fish, can I have it stuffed? And I said, well, if it's really big for its species. And, of course, what did he do? He caught a dace of nearly a pound. And he said to me, is that a big fish? I had to admit it was. So he said, can I have it stuffed? And I had to say yes. Well, he went off back to his parents. I said I'd get it stuffed. I put it in the fridge and I forgot it. And about a week later, I came to look at it and it was far beyond stuffing. So I had to go out and try and catch another one. And I tried for two days to catch a dace as big as the one he caught. 
and I finally caught one which I thought was a little bit bigger and I had it stuffed and I presented it to him and he had it all his youth and on his 21st birthday I thought it was time to tell him the truth so I told him the story of this day and he said I thought it was a bit smaller than the one I caught There are two things about a pike's appearance which d help to distinguish him and give a clue to his nature. When a fish swims, he doesn't actually swim with his fins, but by wriggling his body. The fins are for steering and to give him the first start, the first acceleration away from the light, so to speak. Well, if you look at a pike's fins, you'll see they're big. They tend to be clustered towards the back, like a propeller. In other words, he's designed for a first quick dash but his thick tubular body doesn't wriggle well enough for comfortable continuous swimming. So the pike is a quick dasher, but he's a reluctant traveller over any distance. The other thing is his eyes. Look at a roach or any other victim fish, a fish that gets eaten, I mean, and you'll see that they're set right on the sides of his head in order you could see as far round as possible, almost round 180 degrees, and look for danger. But when you want to judge distance, you have to have your eyes overlapping, like a pair of binoculars. You can see the difference, for instance, in thrushes, which are a victim bird with their eyes on the side of the head, and falcons, which have their eyes on the front of the head. Now, if you catch a pike, when you bring him in, you get a completely different feeling about him than you do about other fish. Other fish seem quite impersonal, but he is sort of real. It gives you an eerie feeling. It's because he's looking at you. His eyes on the front of his head, more like a human being. And the pike needs his eyes on his front of his head in order to judge the distance for his first quick dash. The way to catch a pike is to give him a bait that it's easy for him to get. It's very easy, for instance, to spin too fast if you're spinning for pike. You can see it in clear water. You can sometimes see them chasing the bait and refusing to make the extra effort to catch it. One day on the river Bean, I moved a fish about five or six times in clear water, and he followed the bait. When I went slower, he still just followed it. The joke was that in the end, it was a big trout who dashed across and took it off his nose. The most remarkable example that happened to me was on the famous lakes at Canterbury. Unfortunately, they're now filled in and built over. I was spitting a dead bait on a crocodile flight. Four times a big fish followed me right out from the reeds, all the way along and right to the point where my bait came out of the water. Then he went back to his lair. In the end, I took from the can one of the live baits that I'd been using to spin with and tackled it up and dropped it some way from his lair. Then I cast the dead bait to him and drew him out past it. As we came to it, he left the spinner and turned and took the tethered live bait. He was 29 pounds. Another big fish illustrated exactly the same thing. Every angler has once or twice had his keep net attacked. I was fishing with a friend of mine on a fast part of the river Stour. He was casting out a live bait and free lining it in the fast water past the bushes, past the hatches. I'd volunteered to catch the bait, and I'd settled down in a quiet eddy to fish for roach. And when I had a good few in the net, I thought I saw a shadow turn away when I moved. So again, I took one of the baits out of the net, tackled it up as a live bait, and put it just outside where he would find it when he came looking for his dinner on a plate. Now my friend, working the faster water, had three fish from nine to thirteen pounds. My keep net bait was quietly seized by a 20-pounder. It's this laziness of the pike, looking for food that doesn't need chasing, that lies behind the success of dead bait fishing that's been such a fashion in the last 20 years. Of course, it was really a returning fashion. The earliest fishermen knew about what they called dead bait trolling. They didn't troll so much. What they did, if you read their works, they dropped it in, let it sink and lie, and every now and again they moved it a bit. I like dead bait fishing, but it's a bit inactive for a cold day. I also don't object to live baits if they're carefully hooked and gently handled. There's nothing like a live bait, 
for searching a lake for the first time, to paddle and drift around with a bait lying just off the boat, round the weed beds and round the lily beds, and when he does take, pow! He may be sluggish in general, but he's always ready for a quick dash, like a leopard, if it secures his prey easily. A pike will sense a live bait when he won't see a dead bait. That's because of his lateral line. You can see a row of dots down his side, like a stripe. These are nerve endings that lead direct to the spine. D. H. Lawrence, in a poem once, called them the pike's live sides. And through this, he can feel vibrations in the water. He can feel vibration of anything, of a live bait, or even of a duckling's feet. In contradiction of all this talk about his laziness, sometimes the pike has a mad feeding time. He seems to alternate, like a reptile. He doesn't feed for a long time. And you'll see a roach shoal, for instance, swimming round him while he lies there, not even frightened of him, and then suddenly he'll come on the feed. I remember a gravel pit lake in Berkshire where it happened one day, and my son and I caught 40 fish. And the boy was, in fact, spinning too fast to catch a pike on an average day. And yet we never again had a decent day's pike fishing on that pit. Talking of boys, in the same village in Berkshire, I was once sitting in the front room on the village street, and we saw two little boys, about eight and six years old, walking up the street in order to go and do some tiddler fishing. They had a little garden cane as a rod. And about an hour later, still sitting there and talking, we suddenly saw them come down again. The two of them were struggling under the weight of an enormous pike, and the tail of it was dragging in the road behind them. So we had to try and find out what had happened. We discovered that the little boy had been catching little roach and pulling them up on a gravel shallow and he must have pulled one of these little roach past the lair of a pike in the reeds, and the big pike made his great dash, and he grounded himself on the gravel shallow, and his elder brother, eight years old, jumped in and kicked him ashore with his wellingtons as a boy with a big future. You get surprised sometimes about how big a bait a pike will take. I remember when I was first live baiting on the River Avon, I was in one of those Avon punts with a bait well in it. I ran out of bait, and I pulled up alongside an old Hampshire fisherman in another punt, and I asked him to lend me a live bait. And he chucked me over a 15-inch jack, a young pike. I asked him what it was. He said it was the best possible live bait. I thought he was crazy. But only a short while later, one of the Birmingham men, who in those days were just beginning to come down to the Avon, caught the record pike on that stretch, and his bait was a one-and-three-quarter-pound roach. I never thought much of The Complete Angler by Isaac Walton. I think it's a pretty pompous and boring book. Of course, it's got some historical interest, but there isn't much evidence that Walton was a top angler. I wish some real expert from the same period had written it. The thing that makes me really suspicious of Isaac Walton is his story of cooking and eating a chub. A chub is absolutely uneatable. Somebody once said it's like wet cotton wool full of pins. It's a pity, because I like the chub, He's big and strong and interesting, and he taxes an angler to fish for him well. Really, there are two separate sorts of chub angling, summer and winter. In the summer, all stealth and field craft. In the winter, all patience and cunning. In summer, he lies high in the water, and you must get your bait to him without him seeing you, and without him knowing you're there. Big baits, all sorts. He'll go for the most varied diet. You can try them with bread, cheese, sausage, grasshoppers, slugs, little frogs. You either trot them down to him a long way off, so he's taking them at a distance and he can't know you're there, or you can dap them to him, creeping up unseen right close and working out your tackle infinitely slowly. In justice to Isaac Walton, I must say that his piece about dapping for chub is the best bit of the book. I tried it once, just as he described it. I was fishing for two days on the River Allen, and at the beginning I found a shoal of big chub under a cattle bridge. When I looked at them, they just drifted down. They do that. They don't dash away in a panic like other fish. They just fade away and ignore you in a very aristocratic way. So I put my lunch bag, my hat on it, at the edge of the bridge. 
and put the spare rod down alongside it and I left them there all day for them to get used to. And the next day I carefully worked myself into the same position with my hat on, with my rod beside me. And then with my hand well back on the bridge, I flicked pieces of crust in with my thumb. They didn't take any notice of them at first. Then they started to turn and look at them. And in the end, they were taking them just two foot below my nose. So at that point, I hooked a piece of crust on a long slack line from the rod and flicked it out the same way. The biggest chub came up to get it. Unfortunately, a slightly smaller one raced him for it, but it was very tense and exciting. In the winter, again, you need a large bait, but you have to give him a long time to look at it. He lies down in deep water, and you have to cast down to him there and leave it there. He may keep you a very long time staring at it, thinking about it, but in the end, he's liable to take it because he will feed, even when it's too cold for other fish. This business is temperature is important to fish and the water thermometer is a tool with which you ought to start the whole day and just as Dick Walker demonstrated just how much light will bring fish on the feed or put them off you can do the same with temperature Owen Wentworth and I did it once quite recently we started on a cold day after a frosty night and the water was cold and we could catch nothing we had the water thermometer in the water and we kept taking it out to see what the temperature was at water 40 degrees, we caught nothing. At 42 degrees, we caught two or three chub. At 43 degrees, the dace came on. And exactly at 45 degrees, the roach started to feed. So the chub is the first to feed, and that makes him a great winter fish. Also from the chub, you can learn about fish and atmospheric pressure. You know the old rhyme when the wind is in the west then the fishes bite the best when the wind is in the east when the fishes bite the least etc well I don't believe it's wind how can a fish know when the winds in the east I once went with a friend to fish two or three days on a roach swim on the river star and we caught good fish quite easily we had great success and then on the next day we went along and there was an easterly breeze and a high pressure system as the weathermen call it we took the same approach to the roach, fished hard, caught nothing. And then Sid Tuvey, my friend, wandered off, and in a little while he came back to me with a big chub. We found that we could catch the big chub, lots of them. They were feeding. Now, the roach is a bottom feeder. The chub feeds in midwater. If the pressure builds up, the atmospheric pressure builds up on the surface of the water, it increases down to the bottom so that the roach at the bottom has the biggest load of pressure and it may be just too much for him. There may be just a, like with light, there may be just a point of discomfort that puts him off the feed. But the chub, higher up in the water, is in a degree or so less pressure and he would go on feeding. Now nearly all the east winds come with a high barometer and I think that's the real meaning of the rhyme. People used to be more interested in fly fishing for chub than they are now, it's a pity. It's the same thing, you have to have a big bait. Grasshoppers, beetles, great big bumbleflies. Chub flies are about twice as big as most other dry flies. My own favourite is a great big brown thing called Hardy's Favourite. Cast it out to the edge of the bushes, that's where he waits for his food to come. If he won't take, plop it behind him, he'll probably turn right round and grab it. It's interesting that, because a chub, waiting for falling food, Get used to not minding a splash. As long as you keep out of sight and never thump the bank, you can splash your bait. I had a silly example of that once on the River Ival. I'd been fishing for a chub for about an hour with a float and a bait set on about a foot of cast, and I couldn't get any kind of a move out of him. In the end, I was absolutely fed up with him and furious. I stood up and said, blast him, and slashed the tackle at him. The float hit the water, and so did the bait. And he took it. If you ask any angler what was the first fish he ever caught, the answer is usually a perch. A perch is a boy's fish. It's because the little ones are easy to catch and they're exciting to catch. And of course they look so wonderful when they're fresh out of the water. Patrick Chalmers said that a perch coming out of the water looks like a Japanese warrior in full armour. So if you started fishing as a nipper,
you're liable to love the perch all your life. I've got a three and a half pound perch on my bedroom wall. Let's examine some of the things that the books always say about perch and what lies behind them. First, the perch has a tender mouth and your hook's likely to break out if you pull hard. Well, this is true enough. He hasn't got the bony mouth that the pike has. He opened his mouth up and in between the jaws of it is some very tender skin. On the other hand, this saying comes from the old days. Perch was written about very early. These legends about perch were settled very early. It comes from the old days when people were fishing for it with heavy hazel sticks and they were chiefly boys that were fishing and they did used to heave at them. If you have modern light tackle and if you have a modern rod with some action to it, you ought to land pretty well with all your perch. Second, they say, if you lose one perch, you'll lose the show. Well, my belief is that the perch moves in a shoal on a beat like policemen. Once on the River Star, I discovered this. Two of us were fishing 40 yards apart on the bank, under the bank, under the hollow banks for perch. We were fishing with float paternosters with minnows on them. And the perch used to move under the shelter of this hollow bank. We were catching fish, but I found that I was catching fish twice as often as he was. We never caught a fish at the same time. We both caught fish, but I caught them twice as often. He caught fish once to my twice. So I said to myself, these perch are passing me twice as often. I must be in the middle of the beat, and he's at one end of it. So we tried moving him 40 yards the other side and exactly the same thing happened. So what we had done was to measure the beat of those perch, to find the middle of it, and to find out exactly how long it took them to work up and down it, which in that case was something over 20 minutes. Now if you caught one of those perch and you'd lost him, and in a flutter and a panic he'd dashed off, he'd have been carried off a bit along the beat, and he'd have taken the others with him. But that would probably have happened anyway. They would have moved on past you, just as they had with us. And probably they'd have settled by the time they passed you on their way back again. Another thing they say is that you must give a perch time before you strike. This is certainly true. You get a lot of bobbling about with the float when you're fishing for perch, and you do have to wait until the perch float goes really well down and away. I've seen this explained in the aquarium. I used to keep some perch in the aquarium and I used to feed them on minnows. Now instead of lying still like a pike, waiting until the minnow is in range and then dashing out quickly and accurately and seizing it, the perch chased them and chased them and chased them and missed them as often as not. The reason for this is they don't have the pike's eyesight, which is arranged like binoculars, in order to judge distance. A perch is not as good at judging distance. His aim isn't so good, so he just goes on dashing about until he succeeds. Now, if you're minnowing for perch, and most of these sayings were established when people chiefly minnowed for perch, this sort of behavior is going to cause an awful lot of bobbling about, and you have to wait for the float to go down and away. As a matter of fact, a perch can even miss a worm. I used to throw worms into that aquarium and during the time the big worm floated from the top to the bottom, a perch would dash at it and miss it two or three times before he succeeded. Another thing that's often said is that perch will be found around old piles, sunken branches, locked gates, etc. This is certainly true in rivers and waters where there's any current. The reason is that that's where the little fish are, sheltering from the current. It's just the same in the sea. Off the coast, just where I live, there's a row of piles that used to carry a submarine net in the war. And as soon as the tide runs fast, you can catch bass at those piles. Now, bass, of course, is a sea perch. The fact is that the shoals of little fish don't like the strength of the tide, and they shelter behind the piles as soon as it gets strong, and the bass comes hunting them.
Now, perch are very good at knowing where small fish are, and they like to get their small fish in shoals. This makes up for their bad aim, because they can dash into the shoal with their mouths open and take their luck. That's why you see tiddlers spraying all over the surface like little flying fish when there's a perch feeding underneath. A full-grown perch knows a great deal about little fish, and he can judge how his prey are going to be behaving. When they dredged the River Kennet in the war, I came home on leave, and I found the Italian prisoners scraping the bottom out of the river with a dragline excavator in order to dry out the land and grow corn. Now, round where that excavator was working, there was a cloud of silt, and you could see the gudgeon, the little gudgeon fish, moving in like a flock of sheep, looking for the worms and things that were stirred up. And every now and then, a perch came driving in among the gudgeon. I saw this again perfectly proved on the River Kennet. I was fishing a shallow for dace and gudgeon. I struck when the float went down, and I managed to hook my float into the branch of a dipping willow which went down in the water. It was stuck, and I couldn't pull it out. I tried floating down a number of dead branches to see if I could knock it out, but I couldn't. So I picked up some bricks from a broken-down cowshed and started stoning it. The bricks tumbled down to the bottom of the water and stirred things up. At last I managed to throw a brick in the right place, and the float came free, just as I started to wind it in. A perch moved in and took the gudgeon that I'd hooked. Now that perch, I'm sure, had been some way downstream. As the bricks fell to the bottom and stirred up the silt, it had floated down, and that perch, lying in his rest below, had said, Ha-ha! Somewhere up there a gudgeon is feeding. The gudgeon, of course, is the river perch's favourite fish, the best bait to catch a big one. And I don't blame him. When I used to camp on the River Ival, I used to go out before breakfast every morning and catch a little bucket full of gudgeon and bring them back and fry them for breakfast. They're absolutely delicious. Once upon a time, they used to serve them as a delicacy at all the Thameside hotels. They called it gudgeon tansy. Many anglers don't know the grayling, but it's very bad luck for the ones who don't. This is a fish that's unevenly distributed. Originally, it swam only in those streams which flowed into one particular prehistoric river in the days when the land was all joined together. Nowadays, it has been moved to a number of other rivers as well, but not everywhere. There's no other fish in Britain that could be mistaken for the grayling. He's long and streamlined. He's silver gray with a row of dark marks down him like a sort of sooty zigzag line. He has a long tail and a large tail fin on the end of it, and the dorsal fin, the one on his back, curves over like a big sail with a sort of faded peacock pattern on it. They say he even smells different from other fish. They say he smells like cucumber. I could never detect it, but then I'm a pipe smoker. The nose of the grayling is quite extraordinary. It's a sort of little turned-down snout with the mouth underneath it. But all these things about his physique have something to do with the way he lives. He has a little fatty lump on the back of his tail, the adipose fin, they call it, which shows he's related to the trout. But it's a somewhat distant relationship. Unlike the trout, which is a solitary and jealous creature, the graining lives happily in shoals. The strict old-fashioned trout fishermen were very class-conscious in their attitude to fish. They disapproved of the grayling's cheerful community life and preferred to forget that he was related to their distinguished trout. They disliked seeing the grayling in their trout streams, as if someone who hadn't been to the right school had got into the royal enclosure, which was a pity, because the grayling provides very good fly fishing, and because he breeds at a different time, he extends the fly fisherman's season by several months. He also provides a particularly high-class form of float fishing. Now, what about these peculiarities of his? Well, most of the time, the graining lives close to the bottom. He scrubbles about among the shingle and the silt for all kinds of small life, and roots about among the roots of the weeds, and for this he uses his turned-down snout, 
and his mouth on the underside. When up above him he sees a fly riding on the surface of the water, he's got a very long way to go up to get it. The trout, when he's taking surface flies, lies on the fin, as they say, just below the surface, and makes a short, deliberate and accurate rise. But while the grayling, coming up from below stairs, is on the way to the surface, the fly has floated on downstream. His original aim has to be altered to catch up with it, and he swings over in a long, fast rising curve. It's a beautiful movement. But worse still, his mouth is under his chin, so he has to turn almost over in the process in order to get the fly in his lips. So it's not just a curve, it's also a twist, and he carries it out with the aid of this huge sail-shaped back fin. So that's why the grayling looks the way he does. Don't ask me why he smells of cucumber. Because he's deep down in the water, a good distance from the angler, he's not easily scared. Because his rise is so complicated, he's fairly well accustomed to missing, so he's always ready to try again. All this means that he provides the perfect sport for a fly fisherman who's not yet experienced an expert. Sometimes you'll find a single very big grayling who's gone on his own and is living alone and has learned to lie high in the water like a trout when he's taking surface flies. When you catch him, it's usually a surprise because you thought you were fishing for a trout. With a float, you go long trotting for grayling in fast, shallow water. It's a very good sport. And you can even do this with an artificial fly. The old boys used to have what they called a grasshopper, just a hook wrapped thickly round with green Berlin wool, whatever that might have been. You can use any woolen nymph pattern, one of Mr. Sawyer's. The other great advantage of the grayling is that he's a cold-weather fish. In Yorkshire, they fish from him and the banks are covered with snow. And he'll even take in the snow water as it comes downstream. Lastly, a discovery of my own. Grayling are very good smoked. We once had a good catch of them, and just for an experiment we took them to a man in a mews behind the Gray's Inn Road in London who used to smoke trout and salmon and pheasants and turkey for the quality. And we got him to smoke them. They're quite delicious. What do I know about the tench? Well, I know that he's one of the few English freshwater fishes, British freshwater fishes, that's really good to eat. If you put him in a flat dish on some butter, sprinkle him with herbs and put shallots around him and put him in the oven, is delicious. Of course, I know we ought always to put our fish back, but perhaps if food gets difficult, you might like to know how to cook a tench. Of course, he's a wonderful looking fish. The colour, quite unlike any other fish, is a rich olive green. He's got a red eye. He's got particularly handsome fins, spoon, big spoon-like fins with narrow stalks. And as a matter of fact, you can tell the sex of tench from the shape of the fins. You can tell the male from the female. The tench is also a fish, I think, which shows condition very readily. From the first sight of him, as he comes up to the surface, you can tell what sort of condition he's in. He's either drawn up and a bit lean and hollow, or very filled out. There are tench in slow rivers, but I've never caught one except in canals. For me, it's a lake fish, and also a summer fish, and also a dawn and dusk fish. But I still know that these rules don't always work. I know a Berkshire lake, for instance, where you can catch tench all winter. And Fred Taylor, who I think is the tench master, recently checked out that many of his best tench catches have come in broad daylight. In the lakes, the tench move among the weeds, and you usually have to prepare a swim for him chuck some heavy iron object in the water and drag out the weeds and leave a gap and then bait it up for him. It's not that he wouldn't take your bait, but you need to get the tench to the point where you can handle him. There's a good deal of exaggeration in fishing writings about the number of times fish get away and fishermen get busted. Most fish that are caught in open waters ought to be landed. 
but you will have trouble with the tench because you'll so often get weeded. Another nice thing about the tench is you can tell when he's feeding and you get a tingle of excitement because the bubbles rise to the surface. At first you begin to muddle up the bigger gas bubbles that come out of the bottom of the lake and the bigger eel bubbles but you soon get to know the tench bubbles. They're an unmistakable small spray of bubbles rising quickly to the surface. On the whole the tench doesn't go on and off the feed as most fish do. He can stand change very well and lack of oxygen. I caught my biggest recent tench in the afternoon in a heat wave in 11 feet of water on a day when it was 68 degrees down at that depth. For myself I like to fish for tench with worms or with bread crust. A lot of people fish for them with maggots nowadays but I think we ought to go back to the older baits. No country fisherman when I was young would ever pay for a bait. This is the influence of the town and the people who go out fishing from places where they can't collect bait and also as a match fisherman. And the maggot is an enormously expensive bait. If we all fished with something else and gave the maggot money to the club instead of grumbling about the subscription, I believe the club in a couple of seasons could take the lease of a new water. I like worms when the bottom is decent and crust when the bottom is soft mud. Now how about the tackle for catching tench? Although I have caught a lot of tench with an ordinary float tackle hanging down to the bottom from a float, I've also had a lot of missed bites. If you get a look at a tench feeding in an aquarium, you'll see that it almost stands on its head as it feeds on the bottom. Every time it goes down to a bait on a float tackle, it bumps its head and its back against the tackle and pushes the baits away from him. And so you get the float aggling about and never really connecting. I've tried ledgering. I haven't done badly, but I'm not very good at ledgering. I'd like to be good at it, but I still haven't got it right. What I like to do is to lay on with a lift float. In the still water you need a very small amount of weight. You cast it out, having set it deeper than the depth of the water, draw it back to stretch the cast out neatly. And then, when the fish comes along and picks up the weight, the float lifts instead of bobbing. Sometimes it just suddenly flops over on its side. It's very exciting. In the main, I like to use a pretty big bait for tench, a big piece of crust, quite a big bundle of worms. And I think that if I do this, I get the best chance of striking quickly at the first bite. Tench, like carp, are most used to feeding on a muddy bottom. What they do is suck in mouthfuls of the muddy bottom and blow it out, using the water to wash the food out from the silt. It's when they're doing this, sucking and blowing, that you get all the jiggling about of the float and you can't make up your mind when to react. I think that if he sucks in a pretty big bait, you get a pretty fair reaction and he gets it lodged there just for a moment. So if you have a biggish bait and strike at any real reaction, I think you've got the best chance. On the other hand, there are times when things are the opposite. Sometimes, tench feed on bloodworms and other little natty larvae. I remember John Ellis saying that tench sometimes become obsessed with this sort of diet, especially the bottom is hard and firm. I have reason to know this. In this very last season, I was fishing a deep area with a hard bottom in a lake. It was too deep for vegetation, even in that bright summer. You could feel the plummet knocking on the firm bottom. I fished it two days running for tench. I ground baited well and I used big baits, either a big crust or a big worm bundle. I never had a touch. And then I decided to go perch fishing. I thought I needed some bait so I took a little rod, a very light tackle to catch some roach bait. I started to catch small roach but they were still too big for perch fishing and so I went down smaller and smaller with my tackle until I got down to the smallest hook I had which was an 18 hook on a one and a half pound line. And on it I put the smallest maggot I could find in the box. I thought 
That'll sort out the tiniest roach for me. And I caught a five-pound tench. It took 17 minutes to land. Now this, I believe, was a bloodworm tench. A tench obsessed with that sort of diet. And after leaving everything else, he'd sucked in this tiny maggot because it suited his taste. In that case, of course, all I had to say about not using maggots has to be reversed. How can I talk for a few minutes about trout? More millions of words have been spoken about trout than any other fish, and almost as many words have been written. Nevertheless, things are changing in trout fishing. We're in a bit of a revolution of trout fishing, and a lot is different since most of those words were written. So there may be something to say about trout fishing up to date. But it may sound a bit discontented. For a long time, the trout has been the supreme fly fisherman's fish. I can remember when there were some people in the south of England, in the highest trout land, who still went spinning for trout with little quill minnows. It was a very fine art, actually, but it was regarded as quite unsporting. Of course, a trout eats a wide diet. I know a man who went to a top water on the top river and embarrassed him and his friends by catching a trout which had in its stomach some bacon rind and a chicken head. They'll also eat frogs and crayfish. But it's in his subtle relationship to the water flies and their grubs, the trout delicatessen, that the fish has given rise to a high art. The observation and knowledge and skill needed to outwit him in this particular is very great. But this high art was developed among wild river trout. Where I first fished for them, they weighed about one and a half pounds if they were good fish, and about once a season you caught one of two pounds. They were born in the river, and they grew to fishable size, knowing the way of every insect in the river, and they reacted in complicated ways to the different species. The pike were kept down, the herons were chased away, and the eels that will go through trout spawning beds like a vacuum cleaner were persecuted. But the trout were wild and wily, and their size suited the stream. If any stock fish were put in our river, they were emphatically yearlings, finger-sized, and they grew up in the river, and by the time they grew up, they were wild and educated. Then more and more people wanted to fish, and more and more people had the money for trout fishing, and trout fishing was regarded as distinguished, and developments took place to give them that fishing, and give them the easy satisfaction that people with money expect. I can remember the change from a time I was fishing on the river Lambourne. It was just after the Mayfly, in the month of June. The trout had had three weeks of the rise of the biggest fly that comes to them in the season, and they'd had about enough of flies, and they'd slumped down on the bottom to think about it and perhaps look for some other kind of diet. It happened every year quite naturally, and at that time it was very difficult to catch fish. I was wandering along, and I could find a rise nowhere until I came round the corner, and there, right up in the middle of the stream, under the surface, was a rising fish. I threw a fly at him, not very well, and he took it immediately. In the next quarter of a mile, there were four more of them. Round each bend, I came on one of them, lying in the middle of the stream, and all four of them took the first bite. When I caught them, I put them on a dish, and they all looked as if they came out of the same plastic mould. They were stock fish, reared artificially, put in the river without wild experience, and waiting for somebody to throw them their grub. A few of them had dropped down from the water owned by the man above. Now these matters have gone to the extreme. Trout are stocked in waters beyond the capacity of the water. In order that a lot of people can catch a lot of fish weighing a lot of pounds. I suppose we can't object, but Lord Russell once said that you can ruin anything by making it available to everybody. It's a sad reflection, but I have a friend who last year took up fishing and went after a day's tuition in casting to a put and take trout lake, and on his first day he caught two three-pound fish.
It took me ten years to catch a wild three-pounder. Lord Grey, one of the greatest of fly fishermen, didn't catch a trout at all in his first three years fishing. I hope it's not a symptom of age that I dislike this change. I prefer to think it's a sense of the quality of the art. As a matter of fact, I'm fairly cheerful that people will want to change back again. I made a film on a lost little stream which hadn't been fished for ages and certainly hadn't been cared for. I had to fight my way through the bushes and I cast with great difficulty and ultimately caught a little fish of half a pound. A man I know is a very fine fisherman said to me, will you show me where that stream is? And I told him no. He said, well, I saw it. I realized I've been missing something for years. It's years since I fished for a real wild trout like we used to. Now, I'll risk being bashed by shillelaghs and crummocks and leeks and Cornish pasties by saying that this doesn't apply to the rivers of the north, the moorland and mountain rivers of the north and west. It was on the great rivers of the south of England where the high art of dry fly fishing was developed. And now it's developed this new way that it has and respected friends of mine have defended it. Although I know when they talk to me that they're protesting really beyond their belief. So let's summarize at a time of revolution in trout fishing what will be and what I hope will be. The moorland rivers and the mountain streams will not change. For one thing, they're too far away for most of the people who want to fish, and walking's too hard when you get there. Let the artificial lowland lakes, most of which in any case have been pinched from the carp and the tench, continue to provide a comfortable and status-giving sport. But the southern rivers that were the natural trout habitats, and where the art of fly fishing grew, there let there be a rule that no fish should ever be introduced except yearlings, fingerlings, and let them grow up wild in sporting partnership with the angler who requires that a trout should be a true wild fish before he demands that it's a big one.